Let's look at what's going on in South Africa. And to kind of back up a little bit and get a context for the history of South Africa, I want to look first at the history of the Zulu and the way in which Zulu have really embraced the idea of beads and bead making. In, even to today, there's been a great deal of interest in the colors and variety, shapes and forms of beads as a means to communicate and express social status, uh, marital status, uh, ways in which gender and other important markers of, of, of society are indicated and communicated through beads. Now, traditionally, beads were handmade, each one shaped and carved from shell or bone. And this was an enormously laborious process. Even after the bead making was delegated to Italian company, which was exporting these to South Africa, especially the colors and shapes and varieties that they specifically had called for. You can see that in the far right image there. Natal is the region in South Africa where these specific colors have been generated. And this is an Italian bead maker who in 1670 are already really seeing this as a huge market. So there's been a long history of this kind of exchange of beads into Africa and especially glass beads of extraordinary variety. Shaka Zulu is probably the most famous uh, leader of the Zulu in South Africa, who really solidified his power through extraordinary strategic means, military force, uh, economic development, and sort of unifying large groups of people under his rule, and is able to control large amounts of wealth and dole out uh, authority, his authority and his favor to many of his followers through his exclusive control of all beads that came into the region. So bead making, even though it's no longer hand manufactured, maintains this kind of close association with something that is very exotic, very expensive, very uh, difficult to obtain and represents in itself a value. So we know that there are these traditional use of beads, in, and today they are extremely colorful in the way that they are part of the adornment. If someone might wear as many as 30 pounds worth of beads in their clothing. And they've also new objects. As you can see here, this woman has put all kinds of uh, candy store toys and exotic foreign uh, objects into her own clothing. as a kind of playful abandon that they have with the way they use these materials. One group in South Africa that is quite well known for a long time for its beadwork are the Indebele. And uh, here you can see in the married woman's skirt, instead of a picture making that's being done with beads, strings of beads are sewn together into short strands and they become the kind of color palette that is sort of brilliant whites and blues and greens and oranges that are an important part of the color making in uh, the among the, the Indeble. Now, the Indeble have a very unfortunate history that they were subjugated and colonized and dispersed throughout South Africa. So their cultural identities were, were mingled and, and fractured with other uh, culture groups. And to sort of maintain their identity amongst this time of dispersal, they took to sort of signaling to on their indeble that this is an indeble home. And by doing that, they began by painting their homes in the designs that are traditionally worn in the bead makings. You can see here, these really fabulously painted walls. This is all done by women, and it is all done. On an annual basis, these houses have to be continually up-painted because of the rains. They would discolor. And for the Indeble, these are symbols of modernity. It's a symbol of being wealthy and prosperous and that their home must represent this kind of bold, vibrant cultural identity. 
So the Ndebele, and you, this has actually become a huge, huge cultural thing in South Africa. They have lost the stigma of being in Deble, and other groups have now tried to sort of catch up on the extraordinary cachet of these designs. And we can see them in uh, really spectacular buildings like this church, or as bead making has gotten more fanciful, the designs are now ever more bold and striking. One of the most famous of the Ndebele house painters was a woman by the name of Esther Mahalangu, and she was invited uh, to paint a BMW with her striking designs and patterns. And this is where you see her as she's come in. Uh, the Ndebele, you see, have are famous for their neck rings. You know, the, that they wear up, and that is a married woman wears this uh, neck ring according to their wealth and status. Uh, she became so famous as a painter of houses that she actually has been given the opportunity to, to make in, uh, silkscreen canvases with her extraordinary striking designs and brilliant colors. And this has become sort of the hallmark signature uh, design palette and color decorations for South Africa. Another very important group in South Africa are the Maasai. And the Maasai are very tall men and women who live further north of South Africa. And they have extraordinary beating traditions. The Maasai, here you see Maasai mothers watching on expectantly as their sons are competing in competitions. Uh, you can tell that they are mothers uh, because along their neck ornamentations that are hanging down, you'll see these metal spirals. And a mother, you see the one in the foreground here, has two of these metal spirals hanging down about where her stomach is. Then that is a symbol of a son. And so she has two sons who are of marriageable age. We also see lots of very beautiful and brilliant colors. Young women wear these neck rings, these rings. There's a kind of a base ring, and then layers are built up over on top of that. The base ring is called the bowl necklace, and the sort of top necklace is, is kind of put up on top of that. Before the 19th century, these rings were made of iron, copper, and brass wire by blacksmiths with and they would often weave in fresh leaves and grasses for color and perfume. All of this blacksmith work by colorful imported beads come in. The beads were lighter. They did not get as hot in the uh, intense sun of the Maasai region. And so now more than 20 ornaments may be worn by the bride. Blue one always rests on top. The patterns chosen clearly indicate the region and the family clan. One design which has become increasingly popular in recent years is this design here, which is uh, worn by the bride as soon as she's betrothed and then when she's married to sort of keep track of her husband. This design is actually based on aluminum antennae used for televisions. And so this is like she has this way of connecting across long distances. Then no matter how far they are divided, there is this thing that connects them, like an antenna on a television to its signal. Now let's begin talking about South Africa. South Africa was able to gain its independence and yet not become a black, predominantly black-ruled country. The whites, Dutch and, and British, the British ostensibly allowed the Dutch to kind of self-rule, but with British oversight. But the Dutch really began to become very fearful and oppressive of other non-white people. You had to either be identified as white, black, or colored, Asian and Indian. And these distinctions were set in a passbook that you carried with you. And these are the Population Registration Act in 1950. They could do this at this time, actually, it sort of coincides with uh, an unfortunate circumstance where they get a one of the early supercomputers. You were really registered 
in a computer your race was registered. And there were lots of people who this broke up families, this broke up, it was divided. The division, what exactly defined who was white, who was black, was in, in the end actually fairly subjective because they'd been intermarrying for centuries. And of course, there's going to be all kinds of genetic mix that even people who are white, their hair might be a little too curly, their skin tone a little too dark. These were the kinds of problems that plagued this horribly, horribly insensitive and violently oppressive laws associated with the Registration Act. And as people were registered, they were segregated. There were benches that black people and colored people could not sit on, water fountains, much like the Jim Crow laws that were outlawed in the 1960s and 70s. They're maintained in South Africa through the 1990s. And of course, the segregation, they argued, was so that there would be fair treatment, but very clearly this, the, the actual treatment was an enormous disparity between the different populations. It says here there were 19 million blacks and 4.5 million whites. Land allocation. The blacks had 13% of the land and the whites had 87% of the land. Okay, so you can just start to see, you know, the blacks had 22% of less than 20% of the wealth and the whites had all the rest. So this enormous disparity between infant mortality rate teacher-pupil ratio, all of this really horribly subjugated the black races of, and the black people of South Africa into these townships where black men, if they wanted to work, they had to work under these oppressive conditions, uh, mining for gold and diamonds in South Africa, and everything they bought, they had to buy within the company town all these kinds of abusive labor laws. There were opportunities for people to make some kind of art occasionally when they were in uh, missionary conditions. There was a missionary, a Swedish missionary, who worked in establishing an art center in South Africa at the township and KwaZulu Natal Art Center. And there in 1962, Arazia Mbata was one of the first to really kind of explore woodblock prints. And he became the teacher of John Mua Fangejo. And these men really were some of the superstars of this new woodblock print um, art. And it was largely religious, but they also worked into political themes, stories and events. They used religious themes and ideas to communicate their plight, their troubles, uh, and of course, the political oppression, for which they were very difficult to directly express. There was a lot of censorship at this time. The apartheid laws were very oppressive, but they became even more so when in the 1970s, there was a law that was passed that insisted that all school children must learn Afrikaans, had to be solely taught in Afrikaans. And of course, for a good portion of the population, they had grown up and learned English. And suddenly to have to learn in Afrikaans would be it was this huge upset. They found this very, very difficult to make this leap. And so there was a peaceful protest that was staged against this new law. So most of them could not speak. And on this, there was a horrible oppression. The police opened fire on the children as young as six or seven years old. And close to 100 students were killed in this protest. And the violence con continues to escalate throughout the 70s and 80s and into the early 90s when finally, finally, apartheid comes crumbling down. One of the white South African Artists who 
protested this apartheid was Jane Alexander. She, her most famous work at this time, 1985-86, is Butcher Boys. This is sort of one of the height of this violent, oppressive thing. And here she has these strangely scarred, broken-horned, monstrous male figurines with sort of weirdly white skin and strange cod pieces. And they look around, bored, fearful, indifferent, threatening. And this is a strange tableau of figures who are unified by their characteristics, but do not seem united in their ways of being. It's a, a very disturbing and upsetting group that she creates that sits in our space, watching, looking, and then we have to sort of confront these sort of three-dimensional sculptures. They have this sort of strange scarred-like form that kind of cuts into the center of their body as if their heart had been ripped from them violently. This was originally built with plaster and painted with oil paint. Jean Alexander says that my work has always been influenced by the political and social character of South Africa. My themes are drawn from the relationship of individuals to hierarchies and the presence of aggression, violence, victimization, power, subservience, and from the paradoxical relationships of these conditions to each other. The content I work with is derived from a combination of observation, media information, and the experience of interaction. So she really wants us to feel the presence of these creatures in our own space. And she has also indicated there was, uh, she didn't want to talk about specific works that she has done, but she does say that a lot of her ideas are derived from a writer by the name of J.M. Coetzee, who has written extensively about South Africa and the plight of South Africans in this weird world. And he sort of studies what he calls the deformed and stunted relations between human beings that were created under colonialism and exacerbated under what is loosely called apartheid, have their psychic representation in a deformed and stunted inner life. All expressions of that inner life, no matter how intense, no matter how pierced with exultation or despair, suffer from the same stuntedness and deformity. So apartheid has created these kind of weirdly misshapen uh, monsters that are the inhabitants of this world that is sort of created where everyone is defined by their race. Jane Alexander has continued to make uh, new works, installations, where she explores, again, the sort of animal, human, this way in which the depersonalization, the objectification, the isolation and the victimization of modern South African society. Another very interesting art artist who explores at this time a more lyrical approach to this, if you remember in South Africa at this time, it was really forbidden to talk about the ancient history of South Africa, the San and the Kung, the people who had lived there before the white settlers. That history had been uh, effectively erased or ignored by the Dutch Afrikaners. And here in this painting, Gavin Juntes, who is really sort of looking at outlines of sort of these missing figures who are very characteristic of the qualities of those rock paintings we saw in South Africa so long ago.